Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is in Can you believe we are one week through Great Lent? I said to Father John last night, he said to me at Vespers, he said, wow, can you believe that it's, we've already finished the first week of Great Lent? And I said to him, is it still the first week of Great Lent? <laughs> and I imagine some of you are having different experiences. You like, wait, Lent started? Or some of you, from where you come from, you might like, what's Great Lent? So we all arrived here on this celebration of the first Sunday of Great Lent. Now, Father Zacharias of Essex says, Great Lent is for us a great opportunity a privilege which God gives us to cooperate with him in order to reignite and restore the grace which we received through holy baptism and to quicken our heart. Now today is sometimes called the triumph of orthodoxy. It is called the Sunday of orthodoxy and has been since the year 843, I keep wanting to say 1843 because 843 just sounds too long ago. Now, this is a rare uh, homily where I won't really mention very much the gospel or the epistle because they were chosen as the original celebration of the first week of Great Lent, which was a commemoration the fathers say, of Moses and the prophets. But since 843, a profound event happened where the church, led by the Holy Spirit, decided that we should celebrate this, the Sunday of Orthodoxy, the triumph of Orthodoxy. Now, what are we triumphing? Well, for about 100 years, from roughly 726 to 843, there was a controversy in the church. Now the church has always, from, from the very beginning, had icons as a part of their worship. And yet something happened in these 700s where people thought that they were not okay, that we were worshiping them. And some emperors embraced these ideas and ordered that icons would be removed from the church. Now, if you've been in an Orthodox church for very long, it's really hard to imagine what an Orthodox service or an Orthodox church would be like that did not have icons. So this battle raged where the, icon the iconoclasts, the icon breakers, were destroying icons, were ravaging churches that had uh, walls covered with mosaics. Monasteries were being um, broken into and, and destroyed. And at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, it was called to help deal with this. That was in 787. But it took until 843, with the death of the iconoclastic Emperor Theophilus, his wife Theodora and the Empress and her son, the Emperor Michael, with the help of the Patriarch, restored the icons to the Church of Hagia Sophia, and thus to the whole of the Eastern realm of the Church, or of the Empire, rather. Now, if there is a theme for this homily today, it is restoration. Today is when we celebrate the restoration of the icons. Now there's a decree from the Seventh Ecumenical Council, and there are many things said at that council, but I would like to read you this one thing about the restoration of our icons. We define that the holy icons, whether in color, mosaic, or some other material, should be exhibited in the holy churches of God, on the sacred vessels, liturgical vestments, on the walls, the furnishings, and in houses, and along the roads, namely the icons of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that of Our Lady, the Theotokos, 
those of the venerable angels and of those of all saintly people. Whenever these representations are contemplated, they will cause those who look at them to commemorate and love their prototype. We define also that they should be kissed and that they are an object of veneration and honor, but not real worship, which is reserved for him who is the subject of our faith and is proper for the divine nature. The veneration, according to an icon attributed to St. Basil, is in effect transmitted to the prototype. Who venerates the, he who venerates the icon, venerate it in reality, that for which it stands. So today, at the end of the service, we will reenact the restoration of icons by, par by parading, that is, processing with icons outside. Oh, it's not raining too hard. We'll go outside and we'll make the same proclamations that the church made in um, 787. But then we're not actually in the church until 843. Now, why icons exactly? Why do we have to have them? We understand how the church treats them, but why? Why was it a controversy, and why did the church fight so hard for the restoration of these icons? Because icons testify very tangibly, literally tangibly, to this truth, that the invisible creator became a part of his creation. God himself took on human flesh, the Theotokos, and he filled creation with himself. He entered into creation he who fills all things and holds all things together. He created the world. He created matter. And he entered into it and he sanctified it so that it could participate with him and with us in, in the heavenly worship. In his infinite love, he entered creation so that we could know him and so that we could experience him. Everything that we can experience of God, we experience through the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. This is what we commemorate and celebrate this day. And it, it says in the writings of the church that this is to be today, in the midst of Lent, a day of celebration, a day of celebrating the victory, the triumph of orthodoxy, triumph of right worship because it reflects the truth, triumph of truth over falsehood. And we know in our faith that truth always wins. This is something that requires faith. Light always wins over darkness. Life wins over death. Is there darkness in the world? Is there death in the world? Yes but it has not overtaken the life and the light of Christ. So what do we do with this truth? How do we fit it into our lives and our struggles? Now, if you've ever been to a Vesper service or an Orthro service, the deacon or the priest comes through the church and he senses all of the icons on the icon screen here all of the icons around the walls of the church, into the narthex, all of the icons that are anywhere near. But not only is he doing that and mingling the incense as a symbol of mingling our prayers with the prayers of those who have fallen asleep yet are alive in Christ. Not only is the deacon or the priest sensing those icons, but he is sensing you as living icons of Christ. When we sense an icon, we are offering it veneration, we are offering it honor, we are offering it prayers. And so when the deacon or the priest senses you, when I sense you, I am honoring you as an icon of Christ. 
because you were created in his image and you at your baptism were filled with him. Christ dwells in you and you are an icon of Christ. Now while these historical events, events are sort of an accident of history because the events we commemorate today actually happened on the first Sunday. The procession and the restoration of icons actually happened on the first Sunday of Ortho uh, first Sunday of Great Lent in 784. But by God's perfect providence, it fits into our Lenten journey. Because what is the goal of Lent? The goal of Lent is the restoration of us, the image that was created in us. It is the restoration of our icon. Now, living in the world and sin tarnishes and darkens that icon, but it is repentance that restores us. It is repentance that shines up our icon so that we can truly be an icon of Christ to the world. And like the feast we celebrate today, the restoration that we experience or can experience during Great Lent puts us back in our proper place. It puts us in communion in a new, in a new way with Christ. And not only are we icons of Christ, but every single person, every single person in the world is created in God's image and therefore is an icon of Christ. Every single person in the world is an icon of Christ and is therefore worthy of veneration, worthy of honor, worthy of our love. Now, imagine this might seem silly, but waking up in the morning and saying your morning prayers and thinking to yourself, gosh, I wonder what living icon God will bring into my life that I may venerate, that I may honor. What person would Christ offer me to venerate, honor, and love? What a way of thinking. Now you're all familiar with the two greatest commands, to love God and to love our neighbor. Well, why does God command us to love our neighbor? Because each person, as St. Sophroni has said, is a unique, unrepeatable, infinitely valuable, loving creation of God where he can reside. Each person has the potential to be a vessel of the Holy Spirit, already created in the same image of God that you were created. Each person is an icon of Christ worthy of our veneration. When we remember this, when God helps us to remember this, to see others, our neighbors, and even our enemies, everyone as icons of God, however broken, however tarnished, however darkened, then we can look on them with a measure of the infinite love with which God looks on them. God looks on them with infinite love, the same as he looks at you. If we remembered this, and we had this thought in our minds as we interacted with all the people that God brings into our lives, what a transformation it would bring to our lives. What a transformation it would bring to their lives. And what a transformation it would bring to our little piece of the world. Christ did not come to make the world a better place. He came to redeem and indwell in his icons, to give them new life. Now you might say, this is impossible. How can we remember this? How can we keep this idea in our minds? When, the pe when those icons out there hurt us, when they're mean, when they cut us off in traffic, how can we do this? I mentioned to Father John last night at Vespers that I was, what I was going to talk about today. And he says that we can only see in others what we can see in ourselves. That's why it's so easy for us to see people and sit the sins in their lives, because we're generally well acquainted with them. Our, 
ourselves. <laughs> but to the degree that we can remember and nurture and restore the truth that we are icons of Christ, to that degree, through our repentance, as we restore our lives in Christ, to that degree, then we can venerate the image of Christ in others. And this is what our Lenten journey is all about. Changing our orientation from self-love and self-centeredness to love of God and others. So may we, like the prodigal, come to our senses and remember who we are and remember who our neighbors are, the icons of Christ. And may God, in his infinite love for us, remind us and restore us and continue to guide us throughout the rest of our Lenten journey to the celebration of the Feast of Feasts, the center of the truth of our faith. May God help us and restore us as worthy icons of Christ. Amen. Sundays of Great Lent, we use the liturgy of St. Basil the Great, which you can follow along after the catechumen prayer. Let